What's going on guys? This is Rob and I recently realized there's a story where Thanos meets Kang and it's kind of a cool thing, right? So we covered the story of Infinity Conflict a little while ago and this is basically the prelude to that. So those of you guys who read or who saw our videos on Infinity Conflict, you guys kind of know how this turns out, but it is a little bit of a cool thing here, right? So this initially picks up with Thanos just kind of re-experiencing or kind of going through all the various victories he's experienced over the years and even defeats he's experienced over the years while he's in the realm of Mistress death now for those of you guys who don't know when it comes to the to the realm of mistress death in marvel comics we've talked about this so those of you guys who are familiar with this just bear with me for a second while i run over this for the new folks um originally death didn't work this way in marvel comics instead if you go back and you look at the old stanley jack kirby stories right tales of asgard all you really had was the realm of hella and that was basically it it wasn't until the old iron man stories and the introduction of uh, mistress death and thanos that you basically learned there is a definitive afterlife for anybody who doesn't follow like the asgard guardian mythos basically and so following that basically the realm of mistress death is where people go when they all just more or less die right earthlings things like that and then places like the realm of mephisto or the realm of hella the realm of satanish different things like that are all kind of special circumstances for people who barter certain deals or different things along those lines but for the longest time thanos was always rebuked by mistress death and a lot of you guys probably know that that he had a kind of love interest in the form of the fact that he was always pursuing the affections of mistress death and she was always shooting him down and so that was kind of the cornerstone of him nihilism things like that and there was actually a point in marvel comics when he was banned from the realm of mistress death now that's where the infinity line of stories sort of differentiate from the main marvel universe and the reason why is because the infinity gauntlet was a landmark story it was huge when it first dropped and then of course jim stalin followed up with that with the infinity war and the infinity crusade but the infinity line of comics proved to be so popular that marvel just gave him the ability to write his own stories and so following the events of infinity crusade those stories largely became out of continuity right so they don't necessarily tie into the main marvel universe and so you'll see events unfold but they're all just kind of alternate reality stories for example in the aftermath of jonathan hickman's avengers and new avengers secret wars the death of the living tribunal in the infinity stories adam warlock in an alternate reality became the new living tribunal now that was in continuity in marvel comics only because the living tribunal is a multiversal being so if somebody in an alternate reality replaces him it's basically the new living tribunal across the entirety of the multiverse including the main marvel universe but outside of that, everything else is basically out of continuity. And so with Thanos kind of reliving all these experiences and coming to this realization that he really seems to have everything he wants, that he's still not content. And so he kind of goes on this quest or really kind of goes on a, on a bit of a journey to figure out what it is that leads him to lack being content with his current environment. And so you switch over to Eros. Now, those of you guys who are not familiar with comics, Eros is basically the brother of, uh, of Thanos that he also goes by the name Star Fox. And his ability is to kind of, you know, emit pheromones to basically get people to do almost anything he wants uh, especially to kind of fall in love with him or to see him as desirable that's why you initially see him in bed with just like five chicks <laughs> because that's kind of the thing of eros he usually uses his powers in order to get girls is is really what it is but in the midst of him just kind of musing to himself and sort of you know walking around and so on and so forth he's basically kind of whisked away through a like a kind of time portal and then on the other side a new portal opens and you're met with king the conqueror and a and basically an unfamiliar individual now following that as far as as Eros goes, he's kind of whisked away to a, basically a different point in time on a prehistoric world and is really just kind of trying to escape as best he can and, and get away from things. But for Thanos himself, basically he's met by Corvus Glaive, one of the uh, the Coal Obsidian, and he's essentially told that a kind of temporal disruption has emerged on Titan. And that's interesting enough for Thanos to investigate, right? At the very least, it's, hey, like I can go do something now to kind of fulfill this lack of contentment that I have and essentially find out what's going on here, right? And so when he emerges on on the scene he's basically met by this kind of uh individual who is who's, who's kind of disappeared and kane the conqueror who is basically left and so with this cloaked individual he basically reveals himself to be what is in effect a future version of eros right and so time travel of course is being invoked here now one of the funny things that goes on is that with kane the conqueror when he had emerged he was trying to stay away from thanos and the reason why is because thanos is one of these characters in marvel where he's not easily killed more so than that if thanos comes across you and realizes you're not supposed to be there or that you could offer some measure of him to achieve a goal he's been setting out to achieve he'll take you right he'll conscript you or he'll kill 
you or something along those lines. But one of the things to know is that Thanos is well beyond the power of Kang the Conqueror. And so there's not a whole lot Kang could do and facing off against Thanos. Not only that, because Thanos is so wildly intelligent, say for example that Kang were to appear at a previous point in time, then Thanos would likely deduce that Kang had appeared to him at a future point in time, realized he couldn't defeat him, and so he came back to a previous point to try to destroy him and then end up destroying Kang, right? So it's one of those things where Thanos' intelligence is such, is such a high level that he can kind of figure things out pretty quickly. And so what you end up finding out is that when this future version of Eros kind of starts telling a story about why it is that he looks so old and, you know, what was going on with him in the future and so on and so forth, he reveals that one, it's been 2,000 years since he and Thanos saw each other. And that two, uh, he was basically in a kind of exile for 2,000 years, you know, in a, in, on basically what was a, this kind of world called Zelchia. And that when he came here, when he stumbled across this world, that he came across a primitive race that tried to destroy him. And for the most part, it was only because of the fact that on this world, there's only three different races and anybody who doesn't match that race, they kind of see him as basically an edible animal, right? In the same way that we would see like a deer or something like that as something that we can hunt and kill. And so ultimately Eros is saved by one of the other races here. And the reason why they saved him is they realized he had a ship, right? So he's not necessarily of that world. And so in turn, they were like, you know, you can probably help us <laughs> at the very least help us to, to, you know, to kind of win this conflict because these three races are always at war with each other. And so as this bit of a story kind of goes, on, you end up finding out that this version of uh, of Eros had basically helped this race to achieve, uh, I guess, a higher state of enlightenment with regards to weapons, technology, being able to like evacuate their world using ships and things like that. So basically ushered in a kind of technological golden age for this particular race, right? And in doing that, kind of gave them the tools they needed to evolve beyond the stars and to travel beyond the stars. That's incredibly important here. And the reason why is because what you also end up finding out around that time is that King the Conqueror, as he was going through his you know timeline and really the history of the universe itself and always trying to expand his empire came to the realization that at a future point in time Thanos would come across a basically what, what he referred to as a Stygian darkness basically kind of like a, a mysterious phenomena that essentially encapsulated a world traveled beyond that world into the stars and then eventually fought Thanos and destroyed Thanos and so the desire of Kang the Conqueror is to essentially keep that from happening and the reason why is because any force out there that's powerful enough to destroy Thanos especially Especially in this higher state of godhood that he seemed to have achieved is a threat to the entirety of the universe and by extension a threat to the life of of king the conqueror because remember when it comes the, the way that jim stone's writing this which again is kind of out of continuity here that if something affects the past it can affect the future and so looking at this the concern of king the conqueror is that if a organization or race uh basically conquered the universe at that point in time then it's entirely possible it could spread outward and because it seems like it's not supposed to exist somebody had meddled with time and in turn caused this whole thing in the first place. And so the desire of Kang is to ensure that it doesn't spread beyond the stars and it doesn't spread throughout the entirety of the time stream and in turn basically destroy Kang's empire and even control Kang himself. And so tracing this back to his genesis point, Kang believed that it all started on a planet named Zelchia with people that had the ability to teleport, basically this race that Eros had come across uh, while he was uh, essentially exiled. And the desire of Kang was to basically kill this first teleporter and then in turn stop that from happening. The problem is that it didn't work. That throughout the time stream, this always kept on happening. That this, this you know, Stygian darkness, this kind of powerful entity out there kept showing up again and again and again. And there came a point where Kang got so close to it that it almost consumed him. And so in a panic, he basically sent his ship flying through the time stream with no definitive arrival point. And he ultimately stumbled across this barren world 2,000 years into the future, which basically housed Eros, where he had basically been defeated and kind of removed and exiled to that place planet. And by the two of them working together, they ultimately cultivated a plan that was designed for the purpose of Eros coming back here and trying to find a way to work with Thanos to stop that Stygian darkness from happening. And so the way this plan, the, the, the plan that the two of them concoct is that at the end of the day, the, the race on that planet Zelchia is going to have to go, right? Because of the fact that it all originates from there, that essentially they're going to put together, at least as far as the, the plan that Kang and Eros had formed, that Thanos would assemble what is in effect a small little contingent team, and they would in turn travel to this world and they would basically lay waste to all life on it and that in doing so it should stop that Stygian darkness from arriving here. Now as far as the version of Eros goes that had been thrown into the past much like the future version of himself he had kind of given this race weaponry taught them technology all kinds of different things the ability to travel into space and so the hope here is that 
in doing that, they would basically present themselves as a more intelligent and capable organism. And that the hope is that if Thanos truly dies in the future, that because this race is going to basically has their evolution kind of jump started by Eros and basically giving them advanced technologies, which partially come from the Shi'ar Empire, they would be able to help Thanos quell that threat in the future. And that in doing so, Thanos is basically not going to destroy Eros. <laughs> he can return to his own timeline and essentially not be destroyed or, or kind of uh, or exiled at some future point in time. The problem with all this is that in both of these scenarios, they basically solidify what's going on with this Stygian darkness. That this, this race gaining interstellar travel by way of Eros is really what causes all this. And the reason why is because one of the members of this race who's here uh, is basically met by the cause of this Stygian darkness, right? The cause of this kind of walking death that exists out there. And this person comes in the form of a being called Hunger. Now, those of you guys who are familiar with Jim Starlin's whole story with Hunger and all that kind of stuff, whew, um, this is one of those concepts where comic book fans either think it's cool or they hate it. And for the most part, the only people who really liked it were diehard Jim Starlin fans. Everybody else was like, this is ridiculous. <laughs> this basically sucks. Uh, the whole thing behind this is that Hunger was basically an extra dimensional being that basically latched itself on to, to Galactus. And it was kind of Jim Starlin's way of saying, this is why Galactus desires to consume everything because he's actually possessed by a being called Hunger. Ultimately, it was defeated and largely believed to have been destroyed. The reality is that it's returned here. And the way this explanation is given to us is that at some point, because of the fact that Hunger came from an extra dimensional space, it had kind of been manipulating things the entire time. And that entering into this realm, that it needed a source of energy to basically achieve this. So it basically rode the Infinity Stones into this new reality, bonded itself to Galactus, and then in turn, when Galactus and Thanos fought, that when it was believed that Hunger was destroyed, a small piece of it survived, it left Galactus, and then traveled throughout the, the universe, trying to find a suitable host to bond itself to. And that's when it arrived on this world and bonded itself to this, this you know, one of these three races, and then in turn, rode itself into the future, and then ultimately ended up conquering and destroying Thanos, right? So this is the actual darkness that everybody, or really that, that Kang and all those guys were essentially concerned about. And so the other part of this is that what you end up getting is Thanos, who's essentially whisked away into what's referred to as elsewhere, but it's really more of a far-flung future. And he's kind of met by this, you know, kind of disembodied voice that basically tells him that what's going to happen here with regards to everything taking place with, with Eros and all that kind of stuff, that in the end, it is all still going to result in Thanos dying. No matter what plan they implement here, that hunger is going to spread throughout the universe and it is going to kill Thanos and that ultimately hunger will consume all things. And so in order to keep that from happening, the plan of Eros and Kang is not going to work. And so another plan needs to be manufactured here. The problem with this is that if Eros, for example, is killed, it'll basically lead to a paradox in the time stream. And so what ends up happening is Thanos kind of shows up here on the scene and basically ends up encountering his brother Eros when he shows up at this point in the timeline. And so arriving here, Eros is basically attacked by Thanos, who basically, you know, seems to more or less kill him and then just throw him out into the middle of nowhere. And so following that, because of the fact that the only way to basically keep that future from happening where the universe is conquered by, by hunger and everybody is eradicated is for Thanos to wipe out the entirety of this race. And this is appealing to Thanos because as you guys know, Thanos loves the concept of death and Thanos loves to destroy all things that exist. And so this basically leads to Thanos kind of amassing a fleet based on the new plan that was created between himself and this disembodied voice that was talking to him, the person that we don't see. And they basically eradicate everything here, which is the other reason why Eros was basically killed by Thanos. And so in the midst of all of this, right, like with these members of these races basically evacuating based on the ships that were given to them by Eros, this whole plan of Thanos and his future version doesn't necessarily work out the way that they intended. And so this conversation between Thanos and his future self basically continues when you end up finding out that it's basically revealed to Thanos that even though he was believed to have been successful, even though he thought he had killed enough members of this race, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter, right? The true architect of this whole Stygian darkness will basically arrive and in turn, he'll end up conscripting what's left of this race across the universe into his army and that at the end of the day, Thanos will still die. And so ultimately, the only real way to stop this is to actually go after that source itself. And so this leads to Thanos eventually tracking down Hunger and then annihilating Hunger, right? Destroying this, this bit of an entity here. Now, of course, Hunger tries to possess Thanos and it doesn't necessarily work out that way. Instead, Thanos manages to destroy Hunger entirely and that basically brings an end to that. And so following that, you basically find that because future Eros is alive, that means that Eros in the past was not actually destroyed. That instead, it was kind of a paralytic effect that 
was imposed on him by Thanos and his body was just kind of thrown into the lake and then that was basically it. And that it was really more of a distraction than anything else, all for the purpose of solidifying this plan. More so than that, you end up having Kang the Conqueror that just kind of appears here and then is met by the arrival of Thanos, right? And the whole point was that Thanos was meeting with Kang for this idea that, that in solidifying the destruction of this particular, uh, of really hunger itself, that now Kang is in the debt of Thanos. And so in turn, the, the question Kang has is, then what do we do here? And Thanos' response is like, what are you looking for? I've, I've destroyed this guy. Like, what all do you want out of me? Or what are you looking to achieve? And the idea is that Kang really simply just wants to rule a section of the universe for himself, right? A section of the multiverse for himself. And that Thanos will leave him that section, right? Because Thanos is destined to achieve this level of godhood. That's basically what Kang says. I know what your future is going to be. I know what you're going to look like. I know the level of power you're going to achieve. And when that time comes, what I ask is that you allow me to rule my little section here and you basically leave me alone, right? Because at the end of the day, if that doesn't happen, Thanos will end up destroying Kang. And so if anything, it's really just self-preservation. And so ultimately the response to Thanos is fine. I will do that, but you will owe me a, a debt, right? Like you owe me a debt here in order for me to allow you to, to kind of rule your own section. And then in turn, the, the whole thing here is Thanos basically says like, you will basically travel to the year 4027 and you'll wait in orbit above Chandelar. And then in turn, you'll be met with orders and you'll be told what to do. And so that all that really does is kind of solidify Thanos's role here, right? The, the fact that he is in effect going to become his future counterpart. Now, when you switch over to this quote unquote elsewhere discussion, you end up basically finding out the whole story is more or less told in hindsight. And all this is done for the purpose of solidifying what Thanos will become. That there does come a future point in time when Thanos basically becomes the universe itself. Now, it actually goes beyond that, right? When he attains the Astral Regulator, which again, is the whole idea behind Infinity Conflict. And he basically in, imbues himself with everything, right? He becomes, like he takes over the Living Tribunal. He, can, he, he absorbs the one above all. He takes over Mistress Death, the whole nine yards, right? Like he becomes what is in effect, the entirety of God. And the whole basis behind this story of everything that's happened was done for the purpose of ensuring, as far as that future Thanos goes, that his existence actually is maintained, right? That nothing gets in the way and nothing stops that. More so than that, because hunger was seemingly this universe-wide credible threat, and the only thing that really seemed to be powerful enough to actually stop uh, Astro Regulator Thanos, that this is now quelled, and it's out of the picture, and it's done. And so basically, there's no one standing in the way of Astro Regulator Thanos becoming this most powerful version of himself. What's going on guys, this is Rob, and a lot of you guys have requested that I make a video on Astral Regulator Thanos, specifically like the, um, like a Beyond Omega level video. And, and honestly, I didn't know who that, like I didn't know what version of Thanos that was, because if I'm being honest with you guys, I have not really followed Jim Starlin's Infinity Saga after the events of like Infinity Crusade, right? Like I finished that and I was kind of like, okay, cool, I'm kind of done. And, and that was that was basically it. I know he's written a lot, right? Like Infinity Siblings and, and Infinity Revelations, and Infinity Rev Relativity and all that. I know he's done all that and we'll go back and cover those things because some of those stories are cool, others are not, but I think it'd be kind of cool to just sort of have the whole Infinity series on my channel. So we'll probably cover like Relativity or Revelations or something like that after this. But, you know, I, I sat down and I was like, okay, what in the heck is Astro Regulator Thanos? And I looked it up and I was like, okay, so like I have to cover this story because this story is kind of nuts, right? Now, here's the funny thing about it. As I understand it, this is what the Thanos win story was originally intended to be by Jim Starlin, right? He was the one who wanted to write it. That when Donny Cates wrote that story, Jim Starlin wanted to be the one to create it because Jim Starlin was the one that did so much with the character of Thanos. And so the result of this is that as we know, Thanos Wins was a story that was written, you know, by Donny Cates. And so eventually Marvel ended up releasing this. And if I'm being honest with you guys, there's good things about this story and things that I wasn't really huge on, but there was the same thing with Thanos Wins, right? There were things that I loved about it, things I didn't really, that I wasn't too big on it. I think if both of these stories were combined, it would be amazing. It would be absolutely ridiculously good because of of all the things that go down here, right? But the way that this kicks off is we initially pick up with Thanos meeting with Adam Warlock. Now, this comes hot off the heels of Infinity Gauntlet is really where this little segment of this story comes from in the sense that those of you guys who followed my series on Infinity Gauntlet and Infinity War, and if you didn't, you'll find both those down in the description. Infinity Gauntlet, of course, as most of you guys know, is a story where Thanos discovered and then started using the Infinity Gauntlet and seized control of the universe and then ultimately lost it to Nebula. And Infinity War, or really the, the aftermath, kind of a segue between 
between the two. So it was more of a, I guess like a prelude. It was part of Warlock and the Infinity Watch going into Infinity War itself. The Living Tribunal basically decreed that Adam Warlock had to disperse the stones, right? The stones would no longer work in unison. The gauntlet itself wouldn't work anymore. And Warlock had to basically find people who were capable of wielding the stones, but not using them in order to keep them protected, right? In order to make sure that nobody could reassemble them together again, which seemed like a moot point because even if they were assembled, nobody could use them. But people could still use the, the individual stones, hence the reason for the Infinity Watch. And so during that time, uh, we ended up learning in Infinity War that Thanos was in possession of the Reality Stone. And we didn't initially know that, right? We didn't know who, who Warlock gave the Reality Stone to. But in this, this little segment here, it's designed to kind of fill in that little bit of a gap, right? Because during Infinity War, it was like, and then Thanos got the got the Reality Stone, and that was basically it. And this is designed to kind of fill in the gaps and essentially say that, that Thanos was the one who was most suitable to wield it, right? Because only Thanos could really comprehend the power of the Reality Stone and be able to maintain that kind of discipline, right? Because with this stone in your possession, even your most subconscious desires become reality. You could fall asleep and dream of like the grudge and then like she manifests because of the reality stone and then kills you, right? So like any number of those things could, could happen and Thanos was really the only guy who could maintain that. And so what this does is it picks up, you know, kind of right now in the modern day. And what it does is it kind of gives us this idea that Adam Warlock feels as though something's off in the universe, right? Something's just not quite right. There's some kind of imminent danger coming. Now this is part and parcel to the powers of Adam Warlock in the sense that he really is very much a sort of, you know, Jesus as character in Marvel, right? He dies and he's reborn over and over and over again. He can never truly be killed. He'll always end up coming back in some form or fashion. At the same time, he also kind of has this cosmic awareness and through his experience with the Soul Stone is also sort of part and parcel to the universe. Now, how deep reaching this goes and exactly what this means on like a definitive concrete level, Jim Starlin has never really explained, right? It's almost like the, the White Phoenix of the Crown and like her role in the multiverse, right? She just fixes things that are broken, whatever in the hell that means. And so with Adam Warlock, a lot of his kind of the same way it's pretty ambiguous and it really just sort of allows marvel and jim starlin to kind of have a blank slate in terms of what they want to do with this character and, and so on and so forth but ultimately he ends up basically traveling alongside pip the troll to go see thanos right this is a really cool moment here because with pip the troll of course he's a long-standing member of the infinity watch a long-standing friend of warlock the two of them have been, uh, have been together for quite some time but traveling and seeing thanos is really one of the first acts of warlock for a couple reasons right the first thing is something seems off and thanos might know something but the other part of this is that the two of them have a very lengthy relationship. They've been on again, off again allies. More so than that, there's a huge amount of respect between the two. And so as Adam Warlock begins talking to Thanos and saying like, you know, there's some kind of dramatic change that's coming. There's a kind of approaching darkness. It's a cool moment because Thanos kind of chimes in and basically says, yes, you know, there is a kind of darkness approaching and he kills Adam Warlock. <laughs> He's like, I am that darkness. And right off the bat, Thanos destroys Adam Warlock. Like literally incinerates his entire body. Pip the Troll teleports the hell out. He's like, man, this is wild. Peace. And like bails. And then Thanos is just like, take the body and dispose of it. Done. And so like from there, you pick up on, on the planet Chandelar two weeks later. Chandelar, of course, being the home of the Shi'ar Empire. With Adam Warlock basically re-emerging after this two week period. Then the question is, what in the heck is going on? Right? Like, why did Thanos kill me? Now, Adam Warlock doesn't immediately suspect that Thanos is is of some kind of like terrible, horrible, nefarious plot. He believes he's doing some pretty shady stuff, but he really wants to get more to the bottom of things and to figure out what's happening. The problem with this is that once Pip the Troll locates Thanos and then teleports him and Adam Warlock to it, Adam Warlock gets blown up by a missile. <laughs> He immediately gets destroyed by a missile. And the response of Thanos is like, like when he's talking to his Black Order, it's like, you know, yes, you know, Adam Warlock will come back, but all we have to do is kill him three times. After that, it won't matter. And so what he ends up doing is basically traveling to this particular location, this, this particular artifact, looking for a kind of puzzle of sorts. And the reason why really kind of ties into Infinity Siblings and in the sense that what you had in that story is you had a future version of Thanos that basically ended up meeting with his younger self. And what this, this future version of Thanos is doing is basically guiding younger Thanos to some kind of end goal, but he never actually told him what the end goal was. It was just, you have to do these things in order to get to this point where I'm at. And so Thanos is in a lot of ways blindly following the orders of his future self under the idea that one, he knows himself, so he trusts himself. And two, there's gonna be some kind of grand payoff or something along the way. And so the result of this is that once Thanos basically accesses this particular artifact and learns of this kind of, of map of sorts, you know, this particular location that it's sending him to, of course he gets back aboard his ship. And then ultimately we end up picking up with Star Fox. Now Star Fox, or 
Eros is the brother of Thanos. So a lot of you guys probably know that by now. The two of them have a very, very lengthy history. Infinity siblings really push that history and that relationship to the extreme. But it's one of these things where it's kind of like, okay, Eros has a couple, a couple tools at his disposal. The first one is that he basically utilized the time traveling technology of Kang the Conqueror. And the reason why was during the events of Infinity Siblings, Kang came to the realization that somewhere along the line, Thanos dies. And when that happens, he ultimately ends up dragging the entirety of the multiverse down with it. The death of Thanos triggers a cascading effect that brings everything to an end prematurely. And so the idea was that Thanos has to live. And so uh, Kang the Conqueror basically orchestrated all these different events to, to ensure that, right? So kind of a spoiler for a video that we're going to cover later on. But the long and short of this is that Eros had stolen some of the technology of, of Kang in order to ensure that should something happen where Thanos engages in some kind of nefarious plot, that Eros can go back in time and correct it. The other part of this is that a device has basically been created that's exceedingly small that's also based on the technology of Kang that can be used to essentially track Thanos, right? Because Eros does not have that inherent ability. The next thing that really happens here is a new form of manifestation from Adam Warlock. Usually Adam Warlock's body always kind of enters the cocoon state and Adam Warlock comes back. What ends up happening here is that some guy ends up falling off a cliff and that person is then suddenly encased in a cocoon. And then after a two week period, Adam Warlock reemerges, right? So basically this random being was rematerialized into Adam Warlock and then Adam Warlock returned. This is not normal. It doesn't usually happen. And there is in fact a force behind everything pulling the strings when it comes to Adam Warlock. There's a reason why all this is happening with him. And so what it does from here is it basically picks up with, with Eros, you know, ultimately tracking down Thanos. And it's kind of this cool little, little moment here because Thanos, of course, is looking for Eros under the guise that his future self informed him that Eros will become very important with regards to the various goals that they want to achieve. And so while Thanos cannot kill Eros, what he has to do is essentially find him and then keep him contained so that he can be used at a future point in time. What that use is going to be and the role that Eros is going to play, of course, we'll find out at some point. <laughs> you know, we'll end up finding out in this story. But, you know, from there, of course, Eros communicating with Isaac, Isaac, of course, being the computer of, of Titan, the one that basically kind of governs the whole society and so on, ends up using this tracking device, puts it on Thanos, and then makes himself intangible. Now, the way it is that Eros does this is by manipulating time. And it's a little bit of a weird thing when it comes to the notion of phasing in and out of reality. Technically speaking, the way this works is that Marvel kind of seems to adopt this mentality of like things travel in like one second chunks, right? So like if you were one second ahead of me, I wouldn't be able to see you. But if you're a fraction of a second ahead of me, then it means that like you're kind of this intangible being that I cannot truly see, but you kind of exist in that same moment at me because that, that fraction of time is so astronomically small, right? So I don't know if that really makes any sense, you know, but it's, it's, it's one of those, one of those weird things, right? Like imagine the time it takes for you to turn your head around. And that's really what this is equivalent to, right? Like it takes you, you know, if you, if you were to snap your head back, you know, it would take you maybe like one and a half seconds to do, but like in that one and a half second period, you've also got exceedingly shorter amounts of time, fractions of a second. And what Marvel's doing here, really what Jim Starlin's doing here is introducing this idea that Eros's ability to manipulate time is such that it's not putting him seconds ahead of Thanos, it's putting him fractions of a second ahead of Thanos, which means he's essentially in the same moment that Thanos is in, but because he's kind of out of phase, meaning he's fractions of a second ahead, Thanos cannot really see him, right? It's one of these weird things, right? Like how can you interact with something that doesn't know you're there when you're technically not there? It's weird and it's really finicky. I understand if you're totally baffled and totally confused, it's just one of those plot points that Marvel creates in order to achieve a certain goal. And so what ends up happening here is of course, Adam Warlock and Pip end up tracking down Thanos. Uh, and once they arrive, Thanos has already left the area, but then of course they end up arriving and meeting with Eros. And this is a very welcome ally given the history between these characters. The fact that Eros has consistently worked to thwart the schemes of Thanos, right? So they're allies in that regard. And bringing to bear this information that Eros has put a tracking device on Thanos in order to locate him, and he also has the ability to manipulate time is a cool little thing because it means it's basically they're out if they choose or have the opportunity to use it. The other part of this is that as they're talking, Adam Warlock gets hit with a missile again. <laughs> It just comes out of nowhere and just hits him. And then Adam Warlock is, of course, destroyed, right? That's the end of that. Now, Pip the Troll ends up teleporting away. But basically, it's one of these things where Pip and, and, uh, and Eros have this conversation of, hey, like, we have our chance to, to basically combine our information and to figure out what this bigger picture is, right? It's kind of like the Illuminati effect that using their information that they become greater than the sum of their parts. And so from there, you end up seeing Thanos more or less being teleported away and encountering his future self. Now, this future version of Thanos is amazing looking, right? Like, he looks like he turns 
eternity with the face of Mistress Death. Like, I don't know, it's kind of wild, like, having him look this way. It looks kind of crazy, but he looks like a cosmic entity. And so the question is, how did Thanos achieve this level of power? And the way in which he gets to that point is actually pretty solid. Because what this does is it basically leads to Thanos and his future self having this conversation. Now, his future self is, again, pretty ambiguous here. Again, it's that conversation. Eros is going to be important. You can't kill him. You have to capture him. You have to hold on to him, so on and so forth. But you also have a tracking device on you, right? So, like, make sure you get rid of that so Eros cannot find you, that kind of a thing. Ultimately, because Eros is aligned with Pip, and because Pip has the ability to track Thanos no matter where he is, doesn't really matter at all. But what we end up having here is, is basically future Thanos and what passes for present day Thanos concluding their conversation. And then you end up having Eros and Pip the Troll, of course, teleport to Thanos's location. And when they get there, this planet, the, the planet Zelchia, I think is what it is. The last time Eros was here during the events of Infinity Siblings, the place was a very lush and welcome environment, right? It was beautiful. It was like a giant rainforest, very tropical and gorgeous. Something seems to have happened here that laid waste to the entire location. And so when the question is like, have you teleported us to the wrong place? The response is no. Like this entire place has basically been totally annihilated or totally destroyed. And what you have here is that this location has been transformed into the realm of Mistress Death. That's what this is now, right? It's the realm of death, which is really kind of weird because Mistress Death does not occupy a physical plane. She doesn't really exist on any one particular physical planet, right? You can't get on a spaceship and fly to the realm of Mistress Death. She exists as an other dimensional entity. She literally exists in the afterlife, right? So, I mean, I guess you could, you could get on a ship and fly to the afterlife if the ship explodes or like flies into a star and you die, then sure, you can get to the afterlife, but you can't physically go there. I mean, I guess you can if you can manipulate dimensional barriers like Doctor Strange or somebody like that or like Thanos. But what it does is it switches back over to Thanos and him basically just sort of sitting in space. And where Corvus Glaive and the Outriders don't really know why he's there, they don't really know what's going on, like, like what they're waiting for, Thanos' response is, I've been informed that at this point there's going to be an object or a device passing through here and my job is to take it. And so it's kind of like, okay, like we'll see how this goes, <laughs> which is kind of wild. And ultimately it ends up being a comet that flies through there. Now Thanos, of course, ends up traveling to the comet by himself. And this is an interesting thing because it's not just any regular comet. The more important thing to come out of this is that Thanos states whatever this object is, and he basically says it's power of a magnitude exceeding that of the infinity gems, right? So whatever this object is, it's way beyond the power of the infinity stones, which really, of course, interests Thanos because he's always been on a quest to attain absolute power. The problem with this is that the device hidden inside or the object hidden inside this uh, this comet is not something that can just be arbitrarily attained, right? I mean, you know, it's not like, you know, it was created and then just dropped off on Earth somewhere and like it's just been sitting in a convenience store. It can't be one of those things where just anybody can get their hands on it. That there's all kinds of power protecting it, you know, like this kind of cosmic energy source. And so Thanos, of course, starts ripping it apart, starts pulling it away. And in the process, he himself begins undergoing disintegration. His body starts breaking down. The power power is really more than his physical form can handle, which really speaks volumes to how much power we're talking about here, because the kind of energy that's needed to physically damage Thanos is astronomical. Really what happens here is once he breaks through to the core of this comet and he secures this object for himself, then what it appears to be is this kind of orb of sorts. Now we'll find out exactly what this is and what, is, what it's able to do, but from there, Thanos, when he kind of muses and asks the question, you know, like, I'm not really even sure what this is for myself. Of course, his future version just kind of seems to appear to Thanos and it says, it's both a promise and a myth history. Take this thing and use it, and I promise all your questions will be answered. And so what it does is it leads to Thanos showing up to the realm of Mistress Death. And of course, as soon as he arrives here, Thanos is told, you cannot be here. And that's the way it usually is, right? Thanos has been banned from the realm of Mistress Death for quite some time, right? He's not really welcome here. And the thing about him showing up is he's really kind of musing and saying, like, for all the people who tell me that I cannot come here, which of you is going to stop me, right? How many times have I come in here and Mistress Death says I can't be here, and then she sends some force after me, and then I totally destroy it? Who's going to stop me? Are you guys going to stop me? And Thanos, of course, annihilates all the henchmen and the various people that are there to prevent him from staying in the realm of Mistress Death. They're all completely destroyed. And then Thanos begins speaking directly to Death herself and says, how many times have you spurned my advances? How many times have I made my affections known to you and you've rejected me? How many times has that happened? Well, nevertheless, if I cannot possess, then I shall become. And using this object, Thanos transfers the energy into Mistress Death, pulls her into himself, eradicates Mistress Death in entirely and Thanos himself becomes the new death. 
In the last video, we basically kind of had this idea where you essentially had like future Thanos, right? And Thanos in this future looked like eternity, but whatever it was that happened to him, he seemingly became this like omnipotent sort of character. The idea behind this is that that modern day Thanos is more or less being guided by future Thanos. So we'll kind of get a, an answer to that question, a sort of, uh, of explanation as to what's going on. But with Eros, the brother of Thanos and Pip the troll trying to figure out what Thanos is doing and then in turn trying to find a way to defeat him, they've essentially just been following him throughout what he's been doing right so the idea was that thanos had essentially managed to find some way to acquire a particular artifact a particular device called the the astral regulator or the cosmic regulator and then destroyed mistress death and really like absorbed her essence into himself and then became the new death basically meaning that thanos now controls the realm of the afterlife and so where he essentially teleports away eros and pip the troll follow him but they don't know exactly where he's going the best they can do is just kind of jump forward through time using their device taken by king the conqueror and then just try to understand what it is that's happening right so this is is really just guess and check and so what they do is jump a year into the future and when they arrive a year in the future galactus's ship had basically just kind of crash landed into this realm and when they start inspecting they start looking around they basically come to the realization that thanos has been exceedingly busy that not only did thanos destroy and absorb galactus thanos has also absorbed the infinity stones he's absorbed master order lord chaos the stranger sire hate mistress love he basically absorbed all the cosmic entities into himself and he's been busy now all this happened off panel i'm not really skipping over anything we literally go from one page to this page he's basically just been absorbing all the cosmic entities into himself but the reality of where eros and pip the troll are is that it's just kind of like all right so there's not a whole lot we can do here right like in the present moment right now there's nothing we can do to defeat thanos like we're gonna have to find a way to go back in time and to basically keep this from happening now here's a here's the cool thing before you bounce jim stonen plays time exceedingly smart in this story he does it in a really really cool way and that's one of the things that a lot of writers kind of run into one of the problems they run into ben just ran into that problem when it came to uh, Matthew Malloy. Different writers run into time travel with different problems, and more often than not, it's usually invoked as a means to end a story. Jim Starlin? passes that and, and basically copes with it in spectacular fashion but the cool thing about this is that adam warlock you know where you end up having pip the troll and uh and, and eros who basically kind of jump forward and continue their journey and, and figuring out what the end game of thanos is adam warlock is resurrected and one of the things that we had talked about in the last video is that adam warlock coming back the way that he did was kind of abnormal it didn't always happen that way that he always kind of had a, a particular form and function right like a cocoon would manifest somewhere and adam warlock would start to regenerate inside of it and then ultimately he would come out he'd make its presence known and whatever story was going on that required him to be in that event. What was going on here were things like it was a resurrection process that wasn't normal, right? And so what this meant was that Adam Warlock didn't know entirely what was going on. And so when he basically hops back up and really kind of asks the question, what's going on with these changes in my resurrection process? He's met by the arrival of the Living Tribunal. And the Living Tribunal basically says, I'm the one behind all this. Like I'm the reason why you're resurrecting the way that you are. Now, one of the funny things about this is that when, when Adam Warlock starts asking questions like, okay, well, what's going on? On, like like you know why am i here that kind of a thing the living tribunal says like we're outside of reality but like you are outside of the norm now there's a very particular meaning to that and we will find out what that meaning is later on in this video but the two of them get in a very in-depth discussion and the reason why is because of course you have the living tribunal kind of like is this multiversal overseer right so even if the living tribunal can be destroyed his job is to watch the multiverse and to safeguard it as best he can and so there's nothing that takes place inside of a universe across the entirety of the multiverse that the living tribunal doesn't know about whether or not he can stop it is a whole different argument, but he's always aware of everything that's happening, right? So multiversal awareness, it's part and parcel to his role. But of course, Adam Warlock also addresses the idea that the Living Tribunal, this version is basically an alternate reality version of Adam Warlock. For those of you guys who recall that, in the aftermath of Jonathan Hickman's Avengers and New Avengers and Secret Wars, when the Living Tribunal and all the cosmic entities were destroyed, Jim Starlin wrote an Infinity comic that was a tie-in to it all more or less. It was kind of a loose event, but the notion was uh, the one above all needed a new Living Tribunal since the Beyonders destroyed the previous one. And so Adam Warlock from an alternate reality was made into the new Living Tribunal. So that's just kind of a quick 30 second or a minute explanation. But as to the Astral Regulator and as, how, as to how it is, Thanos has this level of power. This all basically comes through an explanation from the Living Tribunal. And this is a really, really cool concept introduced by uh, by Jim Starlin. That's actually built on something else, right? So for the longest time, when it came to the multiverse in Marvel, Jim Starlin had introduced different things like the custodian of the multiverse and so on and so forth. But the idea here 
is that we of course have an infinite number of universes out there. The question that we always sort of ask here is what keeps one universe from crossing over into another? What Jim Starling gives us here is the astral regulator. And what he says is that in every single universe that exists out there, there is an astral regulator, right? Every universe exists for every possibility. But the Living Tribunal chimes in and says the astral regulators are basically there to ensure that no universe crosses over into another. This is in fact Jim Starlin's adaptation of DC's source wall. That's more or less what this is, right? The idea that the source wall, that every universe has its own source wall, then the multiverse has its own source wall. And these are literal barriers around universes and around the multiverse that are designed to prevent universes from crossing over into other universes and multiverses from crossing over into other multiverses. Jim Starlin essentially taking that idea and rolling it over and basically saying the astral regulator is designed for the purpose of ensuring that no universe crosses over into another, but it's a very complex network, right? And so essentially Thanos taking it has kind of destabilized things. And again, we'll talk more about that here in a little bit, but what the Living Tribunal tells Adam Warlock is Thanos is working towards the notion of not conquering the universe as we saw him do in Infinity Gauntlet. It's not like that, where he's getting the Infinity Stones, slapping them on a glove, and then basically replacing Eternity. Thanos is going for something much, much grander. Thanos is trying to become the entirety of reality. And that's why future Thanos looks the way he does. He looks like Eternity because that future version of Thanos seemingly has achieved that level of power. He is all that is. He's all in existence. And so the result of this is, is, is you basically have the tribunal tasking Adam Warlock with the idea of being the person that's going to essentially find a way to defeat Thanos. Now, in truth, a lot of people could probably undertake this role, but Jim Starlin chose Adam Warlock because the entirety of the Infinity line of stories, going from Infinity Gauntlet all the way up to this story and, and really Infinity Ending, ties into the idea that there's just something unique and special about Thanos and Adam Warlock. Now, again, Adam Warlock outside the norm, we'll kind of cover that here in a little bit, but they are indeed wholly unique characters. They are indeed characters where, for the most part, yes, they exist in different realities, but they stand away from everybody else, right? They stand separate from everybody else insofar as how they compare to like all the Doctor Stranges and all the Cyclopses and all the Captain Americas and all the Spider-Mans and all the Wolverines and, and Phoenix Forces and so on and so forth. And so what this does is it basically leads to this idea that Adam Warlock has to do something in order to defeat Thanos. And so he's kind of tasked by the Tribunal since he's really the only one that can seemingly pull this off. Now, picking back up with Eros and Pip the Troll, they kind of do this jumping around the universe, right? They end up jumping into the future a little bit further and they hop, skip, and around the universe. They go by Earth. They go by all these different places, the space station or the celestial head of nowhere, the planet of Mord, the planet of Spartax, the brood world, a scroll outpost, Rigel, all these different places. They've all been destroyed by Thanos, right? Like all life has been totally eradicated by Thanos. Like even down to the microscopic level, nothing exists there anymore. And so what this does is it picks up with the Loving Tribunal meeting with the one above all. Now, we never get to see this in Marvel Comics, we never really see what happens when the Living Tribunal meets with the One Above All. That usually never, ever, ever happens. And in fact, as far as I'm aware, this is the first time in Marvel Comics we've actually gotten to see the two of them converse in this capacity. Usually it's the Living Tribunal saying something like, I represent a power that's beyond everything or whatever it is. You know, he's just super OP, beyond, beyond Omega level is what he is. <laughs> but the One Above All basically tells the Living Tribunal what's going on in this one universe threatens all of creation right? It threatens all things in existence. What's, what's happened here is threatening everything. Now, one of the cool things that goes on is the one above all's face shifts. He changes from one, one race to another, to another, to another. And so it's kind of a cool thing to kind of see this melding and switching and changing that the, the one above all is not a finite construct, right? Like he's just kind of this representation of everything that exists out there. And what the one above all says is this astral regulator is designed to regulate the entirety of the multiverse. That it's not as small beings as the living tribunal thought it was, right? The living tribunal looked at this and said, okay, so basically Thanos taking the astral regulator creates a cosmic imbalance. And my job is to enforce that. And because he's kind of outside the norm and he has a level of power and so on and so forth, Adam Warlock, you go take care of it. What the one above all says is no, you fail to grasp the complexity of this. Now this is super important because it hits at this idea that despite all of his vaunted power, the living tribunal is not an immutable all knowing force, right? Like he's basically, he's screwed up here is really what it is, right? He misjudged, he misunderstood the complexity and how extreme extreme the situation is. What the one above all says is the astral regulator of each universe, yes, they exist. Their purpose is to keep a universe from crossing over with another. But the truth of this is that they're all tied into a network. So what's basically gone on here is Thanos is playing a giant game of Jenga and he's starting to pull out the wrong pieces. And it's only a matter of time before this whole thing comes crashing down. By taking this astral regulator and pulling it away from his role and then repurposing it for the, for the reason of giving himself omnipotence, he's upset the multiversal balance, right? The balance of all existence 
existence. Not only that, what he's doing can actually happen. He could become the entirety of reality itself. In essence, the one above all now views Thanos as a credible threat. And that's what's so crazy about this, right? Thanos is at a level of power now for where the one above all is legitimately concerned. And at the end of the day, it all comes down to Adam Warlock to be the one to pull it off. And so that's why all these things are, are really sort of crazy here. That's why it's so chaotic. It's because what we do is we basically jump to, you know, present day Thanos, for lack of a better word, who's absorbed all these cosmic entities meeting with his future self, right? The one that is essentially merged with all of reality. And the whole reason behind this is the fact that future Thanos is, is fearful of the fact that somebody will figure out what he's doing and basically stop his younger self. And that's the cool thing here, right? This is Jim Solomon playing it smart with reality, that we would look at this and we would say, okay, so if present day Thanos is talking to his future self and his future self becomes a connected to all, all of reality, he becomes everything in existence, presumably, you know, transcending the one above all and the living tribunal and all that, then like, why would he concern himself with like making sure his younger self gets there? And the reason why is because anybody could screw it up at any point in time. It's one thing to achieve that role, but the reality of what Thanos has learned with regards to the multiverse is the fact that there's an infinite number of realities out there and anything can happen. Somebody can pop up, they can be at the right place at the right time. And so it's essentially guiding himself, right? Making sure that like the things that could get in his way don't get in his way, right? That, that just because he ended up in this future, you know, and, and became this being doesn't mean that it's guaranteed, right? Like if, for example, he was supposed to kill Adam Warlock at a particular point in time and he didn't, everything gets thrown off and any number of things can cause that to happen, right? Any number of things can, can get in there. And so what you do is you pick up basically with Eros and with uh, with Pip the Troll kind of coming to this conclusion. It's, it's, it's sort of a red herring here, the way Jim Starlin plays it, because it's like, okay, so like they're going to go back in time. They're going to kill Thanos when he's a baby and basically stop the future. Okay. So like, this is like, and, and there are some writers out there who would say, and this is how we end the story, guys. Thanks for watching. You know, Jim Starlin does this. And before Eros can pull it off, Adam Warlock pops up and says, if you do that, nothing will happen. This not going to work because what's going to happen here is things are going to be worse and this is really Jim Starlin tying in to everything he's done with regards to Adam Warlock and Thanos and the entire Infinity series right the relationship between the two and when Jim Starlin was writing the old Adam Warlock comics the relationship between Adam Warlock and Thanos was that Thanos had actually come to the aid of Adam Warlock and helping Adam defeat his own future evil counterpart the Magus you know Magus's attempt to basically gain the the Infinity Gauntlet for himself during the events of Infinity War Thanos being part of Warlock in the Infinity watch and basically having the reality stone and then giving a false stone to uh the magus is what led to magus's defeat at the end of the whole thing right he had an affinity gauntlet but he wasn't all powerful because he didn't have all the infinity stones what adam says here is that if eros kills thanos as a baby then it means at each one of those pivotal moments throughout the entirety of the universe when thanos helps him defeat the magus when thanos gives the magus a false reality stone when each one of those things takes place that it won't happen and the future that's going to come out of that is going to be a future where the Magus will dominate all of reality and put the kind of things that Thanos did during Infinity Gauntlet and Infinity War and Infinity Crusade and the Infinity Siblings and all that kind of stuff, it'll put all of that to shame. And so, of course, Eros basically backs off his actions and destroying Thanos as a baby, and they essentially teleport back to the modern day or 2000, 2018 at the time this is being done to the base of where Eros is operating at. And when the question is, what do we do here? You know, if, if this plan of killing Thanos as a baby is not going to work, then what plan do you have? And Adam Warlock says this, and he kills, he kills Eros. Pip the Troll begins to freak out. But the response of Adam Warlock is, according to the Living Tribunal, this is the only thing that's going to work. And so what we do is we basically jump back to the future with, with Thanos, uh, who's essentially absorbed all these various cosmic entities. And this, this you know, we'll, we'll call him like primitive Thanos, more or less in comparison to his like ultra powerful future counterpart. But primitive Thanos is met by the arrival of Eternity. And he was told by his future version, Eternity and Infinity are really a couple of the last stops that you have before this entire thing is, is taken care of, right? Before it's all done. And so what this does is it leads to a conflict between the two. Now, the cool thing about this, and I love how Jim Starlin plays on this, Thanos, this is not his first time up to bat. He's done this dance. He's played this game. He understands the, the significance of eternity and infinity, the power that they wield, but Thanos is not concerned about either of them because the power he possesses in the form of the Astral Regulator is way beyond the power of, of infinity and eternity. And so where they show up here and they basically start using their various abilities to try to destroy Thanos, we jump back to Eros. And Eros, of course, having been killed in the modern day, ends up traveling to the realm of Mistress Death because at the time that he died, Thanos had not killed and absorbed Mistress Death yet. And so what it meant is that basically being there, Mistress Death is aware of the plot that Thanos has and his attempt to like basically show up on her doorstep and kill her at some future point in time, which kind of makes sense. Being a cosmic entity that understands 
the notions of like life and death and things like that it makes sense that she would be aware of that and so with that being the case she believes eros is there as a spy and so in order to resolve the situation she banishes eros from her realm that action right there is what saves all things in existence like that action right there is why eros is so important and that's why adam warlock killed him is because that one thing is going to, to essentially be this saving grace or at least i assume it is right and so transitioning back to thanos facing off against eternity and, and infinity the reality is they're really more pomp and circumstance here than anything anything else they're blowing a bunch of hot air that for all their talk of like you're going to fall we're going to destroy you all that kind of stuff it's really just more pride than anything else in the face of the astral regulator and the power that it represents in the face of, of all these vaunted abilities that he has infinity and eternity fall and it's, and it's kind of crazy because the conflict between the two of them basically spans like all things in existence right it, it expands all of time and space across the universe itself all time across the universe like everything across the entirety of the universe is felt by them from the universe's very beginnings all the way to its very end the point at which it dies like this is what we're talking about here this is the kind of level of power that we're discussing because that's what these characters represent infinity represents time and eternity represents space and so to fight them is to fight all of time and space and so that's why these these conflicts between these beings literally have shock waves across the entirety of the universe's history and the space the universe occupies it's like being able to witness an explosion all at the same time right so like there, there's like an atomic bomb that goes off or some kind of explosion doesn't matter what it is but like you see it and then a person from 500 years ago sees the exact same explosion and a person in a thousand years sees the exact same explosion some kind of an event across all time and space i know it's super meta and i know it seems kind of kind of crazy and a little mind bending but that's what we're talking about when we're talking about cosmic entities but regardless of how hard they fight and regardless of what tricks they pull up their sleeve and the sense of infinity manipulating time and trying to like age thanos and or, you know try to de destroy thanos and the collapse of his physical form and all that kind of stuff none of it works and the two of them are absorbed into themselves and when that happens thanos is confronted with the with the living tribunal and the living tribunal basically appears here and says this cannot be allowed to stand this amount of power that you have what you've done it's created an incredible imbalance in the universe itself more so than that you threaten the entirety of the multiverse there's nothing to negotiate here there's nothing for us to talk about you thanos are going to have to fall and so what we do is we jump back to eros and so eros resurrecting basically coming back from the dead having been banished from mistress death this is what the living tribunal was referring to by being outside the norm that adam warlock can never die adam warlock will live forever he will always resurrect no matter how you kill him no matter what means it is that he's his physical body is destroyed somebody somewhere will be walking and like they'll die they'll just kill over from a heart attack or they'll be hit by a bus and they'll be used as a method by which adam warlock returns thanos has been banished from the realm of mistress death he was banished from her realm long before this story took place right he was banned he can never ever die like now eros is the exact same way they exist outside the norm because they're immutable forces now right they're not really on par with cosmic entities and so far as like they're all powerful it's not really that way it's simply the natural order of things which is things are born and things die and then there's them they're outside the norm they're outside the natural order and so that's the reason why why eros is so important here is because with him and adam warlock working together presumably they should be able to defeat thanos and so following this we pick up basically with this massive destruction you know this massive explosion seemingly in the entirety of this system and the defeat of the living tribunal and that's why this is important is because when you think of a fight between the living tribunal and you think of the living tribunal's destruction most likely you think of hickman's avengers and new avengers because that's really the only time that we ever saw that happening right the only time we saw before that was during marvel the end and it was really more of thanos absorbing all of reality into himself and then recreating it again usually when you think of like an extremely powerful being like the living tribunal being destroyed you think of like this massive explosion of energy that would just shatter the entirety of the multiverse it's like it's like it's like grabbing a brick and just throwing it into a into a glass house right it's just it's going to shatter the entire thing right it's going to it's going to destroy some part of the glass house and the rest of it's going to collapse under its own weight right that's kind of how you you assume that situation to be the way this plays out though is again it's basically just this idea of thanos absorbing the living tribunal into himself but that's where thanos is now at this moment right now thanos has absorbed the living tribunal into himself or at least that seems to be the case now things are going to be explained a little bit more at a future point in time but like thanos basically jumps in with his future counterpart like starts talking to him and and essentially his future counterpart says you are now where i am right like we are now where we're supposed to be you have achieved the, the level of power i wanted you to achieve we are now one and literally they merge into a singular being right now this is just jim starlin's way of rectifying the time stream the future version of thanos got modern day thanos to this level of power and the two of them are now occupying the same space at the same time the truth is that they're a singular being right they're the same person both cannot exist at the same time and so they basically become the singular person and when that happens thanos says 
is now the real game begins. Now I, Thanos, who am essentially the sum total of all of reality, will go forward and I will face off against the one above all. Okay, so we are getting into Infinity Ending, and here's the funny thing. I initially planned on waiting until like next week to start this, but you guys have been screaming at me when we covered Infinity Conflict to start this next part. <laughs> so I was like, okay, I mean, I don't really see a reason not to, but there's a couple things that I do want to explain here because there was a little bit of uh, uncertainty that I noticed in the comments section. Some of you guys seemed a little unsure. And so the, the way this has played out so far is we essentially had like two versions of Thanos, right? We had present day Thanos, and then we had future Thanos. And the future Thanos Thanos had somehow found a way to essentially absorb all these various cosmic entities, right? Everybody from localized and, and smaller cosmic entities like Mistress Death or Eternity or Infinity, all the way up to like the Living Tribunal. And so initially the question was, why is he working with his younger self? And the idea was that he was guiding present day Thanos through a series of steps to ensure his own survival, right? To ensure that he would become the person he became, you know, with regards to future Thanos. And so the result of this is that from there, the question was, okay, then if there's something standing in his path, then why doesn't he stop that? And this really came into play with the death of Eros and the nature of Adam Warlock, in the sense that as we talked about in the last video, Adam Warlock is essentially immortal. He'll always come back, right? No matter how he dies, and no matter how much time passes, he'll always return. This basically placed Adam Warlock outside of the norm, because he does not abide by the normal rules of life and death. When Eros was killed by Adam Warlock, Adam Warlock had, had hoped that Mistress Death would banish Eros from her realm for whatever reason, either because she she understood Adam Warlock's goal in killing him, or because she believed that Eros was going to be working alongside Thanos to basically usurp her role. Whatever the reason was, we knew that it was because she was afraid that Eros was working alongside Thanos. She banished Eros from her realm, and that in turn landed Eros outside the norm, because he now no longer abides by the normal rules of life and death. He's essentially immortal. He can never really die. And so having said this, what it did is it led up to this massive battle. And that was actually kind of a, a little bit of a portion that, that seems a little murky here. We essentially had a scenario where Thanos Thanos had absorbed the living tribunal into himself. What makes this kind of crazy is that as this comic picks up, we've got the one above all, and then you've got the living tribunal there, right? So I don't know if this is some kind of an error or if I misinterpreted it, you know, how, however it was that happened, but literally in the preface of the book, like as you open it up and you know, one of the last things it says is like, you know, present day Thanos has killed the last embodiment, the living tribunal itself and merged with his despotic future self, right? So like he absorbed the living tribunal. So the question is, how is the living tribunal here? That's really kind of how this is. Now, at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter because when this happens, the one above all basically tells Thanos to stop, right? To stop his actions and to in turn to go back to his normal role. And Thanos says no. Now, the question that a lot of people have here and, and that I noticed was a lot of people were asking if the one above all is this nigh omnipotent, indestructible and immutable force inside the entirety of the Marvel multiverse, then why doesn't it just will Thanos out of existence, right? There's nothing the, the one above all cannot do. And the reason why is because Jim Starlin is basically altering the form and function of the one above all. And stories from years past, right? Old Fantastic Four stories, old sensational Spider-Man stories. The role of the one above all was essentially kind of a prime mover in the sense that like he created the first universe. We saw that in Al Ewing's Ultimates. And then the first universe basically fractured when the aspirants and the celestials went to war. And then the, those fractured pieces created the first multiverse. And by whatever manner and whatever means, those different universes came to an end and then were reborn again. But the one above all didn't really sit back and then like create the first multiverse. And then every time a universe dies, he creates a new one. He just sort of set things in motion and they went through whatever path they went through. But regardless of his hands-on or, or lack, lack thereof, his hands-on approach with the multiverse, the reality was there's nothing the one above all cannot do. He's, he represents the writers or the artists or Stan Lee or Jack Kirby, whichever depiction you want to go with, depending on which comic you're reading at the time. Jim Starlin is basically modifying that. And what he says here is this idea that the, the one above all is actually not really a slave to the structure of the multiverse, but he can't break its rules. That the one above all basically created all things in existence and there are certain safeguards there that not even the one above all can can get past, which really kind of defies his purpose, right? It's, it's kind of like that that old school quagmire, can God create an object that's too heavy for him to lift? That's really what this is, right? You know, kind of this idea of defying omnipotence. And so that's why it seems a little strange because the one above all should be able to just will Thanos out of existence, that it, it should just kind of end that way. But the result is that when you're invoking something like this, you can't, right? You can't on one hand bring 
and the one above all, and basically kind of create a scenario where Thanos faces off against him in any believable way, if like the one above all is this immutable and indestructible force that nothing can stop. And so what happens is over the span of the first three pages, the one above all and, and I guess the living tribunal, you know, in this instance, face off against Thanos and Thanos immediately absorbs them. And so essentially Thanos has now become the new one above all. And that's the crazy thing about this, right? It happens like that in the blink of an eye. And it's a wild situation because you literally have Adam Warlock and you have Eros and you have Pip the Troll watching this whole thing go down. And when Thanos re-emerges, Thanos is now all things in existence. From that point going forward, they bail. Eros grabs Pip the Troll. He grabs Adam Warlock with the intention of teleporting away. Adam Warlock yanks his hand away. Eros and Pip the Troll are gone and Adam Warlock remains behind. And talking to Thanos, you know, the, the new one above all, we kind of get this explanation, right? The, the sort of explanation in terms of what he can do and so on and so forth. Now, what's also interesting is he points out this notion that because of the fact that Adam Warlock and Eros exist outside of the of the norm, that Thanos, while he can detect them, has to work hard to do it, right? They're not just easily perceptible to him. It's almost like a, it's almost like trying to detect a dark gray amidst a black background, right? It's possible. You just really have to be looking for it. And so because of that, Adam Warlock one immediately picks up on that. And then two, you end up having Thanos who basically pulls Adam Warlock into himself for the purpose of always being able to locate Adam Warlock, right? To kind of remove that aspect. And then from there, Thanos starts to muse. And this is normal for, for Jim Starlin. And it's actually one of the things that always made his handling of Thanos so cool. The way he would write Thanos was really more of, he would see himself almost kind of like in a philosophical way, right? He would, he would kind of muse about these things. He says, now I am linked to all there is, right? He's not actually, I mean, he is all there is, but he's linked into everything, right? Everything from the past and the present throughout every single universe that exists. And it's almost overwhelming, right? It's almost overwhelming for Thanos to sit down and say, all actualities, all realities, that exist out there, every universe that exists in the entirety of the multiverse, I am all those things. This is a whole new level of power that's way beyond anything Thanos has ever had before. The closest he ever got to this was during Marvel The End when he absorbed the multiverse into himself and then brought it back with death basically being permanent, meaning nobody could be resurrected again. It was kind of a criticism of Marvel in the sense that they always killed and brought back people and to basically kind of remove that or try to make it in continuity. Marvel ultimately said no because they like being able to kill people and then bring them back later. It makes for good clickbait storytelling. What it does show here is really kind of the role of the one above all in terms of all the various forms that it exists in. And when it comes to the one above all in Marvel, it's one of these things where like it's it's Marvel's version of the presence from DC and the presence is like DC's version of the one above all right and, and what I mean by that is what you have inside of of the comic book landscape you have a singular universe then you have stuff like an oververse or you have an underverse so on and so forth but the the the, the broad uh, broad strokes here are that you have a singular universe then you have a multiverse and then you have what's called the omniverse and the way this works is that a universe is a universe right it's just a singular universe that you occupy the main Marvel universe the ultimate universe the Marvel cinematic universe those those different universes make up the entirety of the multiverse the omniverse is composed of all things in existence, right? So there's the Marvel multiverse and the DC multiverse and the Spawn multiverse. And like like any concept that exists out there is part of the greater omniverse. And Marvel's one above all is kind of a guy who oversees all that, right? It's Marvel's God above all gods, essentially. So it's, it's, it's one of these things where they all kind of cross over and all gets really weird. And it's not really designed to say that like the one above all is over the presence. It's Marvel kind of saying, I mean, our version is. And then DC's like, no, our version is. And Spawn's like, no, 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 you're both wrong. Our version is. So it's... it's <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of one of these things where it just sort of goes around. But Thanos is basically tapping into and overseeing everything across all every single universe in every single multiverse on every single property that exists in the world belonging to anybody regardless of whoever made it that's how far reaching this is and so it gets kind of crazy here because with that being the case eros kind of picks up on the notion of what we talked about already that thanos cannot easily recognize him because he's outside the norm thanos has to hunt for him as hard as he possibly can right a needle in a stack of needles is really what this is and so with that being the case because pip the troll is essentially viewed as thanos as one of the people out there who can throw a wrench in the works then what Eros does is basically tear up a backpack more or less and then put Pip the Troll inside of it so that Pip the Troll is as close to Eros as he can possibly be. And by extension of Eros being outside the norm, that will hopefully kind of permeate to Pip the Troll. Now, it really kind of seems to be this idea that it's not really like an Eros shaped hole in the universe, if that makes sense, almost kind of like a permeation of like this energy that makes him outside the norm that hopefully will also encompass uh, encompass Pip the Troll. That kind of seems to be what he's shooting for. And Jim Starlin plays it fast and loose. We don't really get any defense 
definitive answers there, but we're kind of more or less left to believe that is actually the case. And so what ends up happening is, is Eros and Pip the Troll basically say, okay, fine, then let's see what's going on. Let's see if we can find a way to defeat Thanos in the past or whatever it is, kind of throwing out these various MacGuffins here. And you end up having Eros and Pip the Troll show up on the ship of Thanos, which is currently occupied by Corvus Glaive and Proxima Midnight, but then they vanish, they disappear. And Eros figures out this is happening because what Thanos is doing is getting rid of anybody who knows his plan and who could potentially find a way to take him out. That's what's so cool about this, is Thanos is just kind of getting rid of people here and there. But this is the one thing to understand here, and this is this is awesome the way Jim Starlin does it. Thanos is handling his omnipotence and his power the way a mortal person would. Thanos is not handling his abilities the way the one above all would. And there's a huge distinction there, and we'll find out what that distinction is as we get through this video. But from there, you pick up with Adam Warlock, who basically emerges after having been ensnared by Thanos with Thanos' ability to see him, and essentially locates Kane the Conqueror. Now again, Kane the Conqueror was from a previous Infinity story, but it was by virtue of Kane the Conqueror that Eros managed to attain his time traveling technology, as well as a few other things going on. But what this means is that using the ability of Kang to manipulate time, Adam Warlock seemingly has some bit of an out. And so from here, we jump to one of the most important parts of the story when we pick up with present day Thanos. And present day Thanos, his consciousness is basically inside the mind of future Thanos, right? Like this version of Thanos that merged with the one above all and all that kind of stuff, that's future Thanos who's done all that. Present day Thanos is just kind of a consciousness that's along for the ride. And it's cool when he basically talks about this, right? He says things like, yes, I'm still here. Like, you know, I was, I was basically press ganged into this situation, but what it shows is that their ideologies are not entirely linked. Present day Thanos is not fully on board with what future Thanos is doing, right? He knows his plan. He knows what he wants to achieve, but even for modern day Thanos, that seems pretty extreme. And that says something, right? Given whatever this future plan or whatever this plan of future Thanos is, if present day Thanos looks at that and says, yeah, man, like that's pretty crazy, man. Like that's pretty extreme. Then that means it's really got to be something, right? Because we're talking about a guy who got a hold of the infinity gauntlet and wiped out half the life in the universe just to impress a girl, right? So like, it, it's kind of crazy. Like it's kind of nuts, you know, in terms of this, this whole thing going, but what it also shows here and really what he, what he basically tells us is that the amount of energy and the amount of focus necessary to be able to handle this much power while it's within the abilities of future Thanos to contain these abilities, it's a whole nother thing to understand how to use them effectively. And so what this means is that future Thanos is still figuring out what it is that he can do. He hasn't fully been able to channel the totality of the one above all's power. Now, this is important because what it means is that it presents this idea that maybe even the one above all was limited by its own imagination. And that if Thanos can essentially break free of those limitations, then his power would transcend the previous one above all's power. The reality of this is that what future Thanos is doing is hunting around for Eros. It's the thing that's dominating his mind. And the reason why is because Eros will in some form or fashion find a way to basically defeat future Thanos, right? Like Eros could find a way to defeat his brother. It's possibly only a matter of time before Thanos loses this power of the one above all. So again, it's super cool. It's a guy with the power of God who hasn't quite figured out how to use it all yet. And so from there, you basically pick up with Eros. He's like, okay, one, he asks Isaac, the sentient computer right before it's destroyed by future Thanos, if he can figure out a way to calculate when the universe is going to end. And they're able to, you know, he's able to basically draw, you know, kind of create an, an algorithm, you know, in the blink of an eye, like super advanced, you know, otherworldly computers do, and then essentially calculate when the universe is going to end. And when Eros and Pip the Troll are teleported there, it's just a giant empty canvas. And then future Thanos simply says, let there be an end. In essence, Thanos destroys himself. The idea behind this, and this is what's really important here. The idea behind this is that Thanos, you know, with, with these limitations that were created by the one above all, the indication is that Thanos is still bound by those. And so what this really seems to point out is that the future version of Thanos, his goal after having basically defeated Eros and ensuring that nobody can be in his way, is to basically wipe out everything in existence and then recreate it as himself being the one above all. He's wiping the board clean and starting over again. It removes any of the limitations that were created by the previous one above all, and Thanos is free to recreate all the multiverse and the omniverse as he sees fit. And that's what's so wild here is because what we do from there is where Eros and Pip the Troll are essentially dispelled from that future and sent back to the modern day. What it does, you know, because of the fact that they cannot die, right? So like they're just kicked back to the modern day. What it does is it picks up with Kane the Conqueror and Adam Warlock having a discussion with each other. And Kane the Conqueror, not really wanting to, essentially admits that what, you know, the, the kind of feel that he's on right now with Thanos attaining the power of the one above all, with the actions of Adam Warlock, things like that, these are way beyond what Kang is normally used to. And the reality is that he's basically being reduced to a guy who can just help 
help Adam Warlock out as best he can. Despite all the intelligence and all the time traveling abilities of Kang, he's way out of his element here. More so than that, Adam Warlock throws in this idea and really kind of gives us some, this amazing notion that future Thanos operating with all this power, again, has not figured out how to use it. And in the time that he could be taking to figure out how to use it, instead, he's taking that time to focus on finding Eros. This makes him vulnerable. This is basically just a really, really, really powerful Thanos. And that's why we don't really have an instance where it's like, well, why doesn't he just go back to the very beginnings of time and stop Eros from being born? If Thanos went back in time and killed Eros at birth, then perhaps future Thanos never exists. It is really kind of bound by the rules of time, right? The, the rules of time travel, time manipulation, different things like that. And so what we end up doing is picking up with Adam Warlock, right? Adam Warlock basically trying to find a particular access point within the cosmos, basically an access point with, that will allow him to enter the psyche of, of future Thanos, right? Because he's undetectable, or at least it, it seemed to be that way. And then like entering the future psyche of Thanos, and then in turn, you know, just kind of getting a better understanding of what's going on. Now, the reason why Adam Warlock is able to do this is not because he's undetectable. That's my mistake. He is, right? The, the reason why Adam Warlock can do this is because Adam Warlock is part and partial to Thanos. And so Thanos won't really feel it as like an ant biting him or anything like that. He'll just kind of see it as the normal comings and goings of the multiverse and how things function and so on and so forth. And because his attention is off of Adam Warlock, because he believes that Adam Warlock is now a negated factor, right? He's not anything to really worry about. Instead, with him focusing on Eros, it leaves Adam Warlock open to invade the psyche of Thanos because he's just not paying attention. But before Adam Warlock can do that, he's suddenly met by the arrival of an unexpected character. Okay, so we are picking back up again with the infinity ending and we're actually, we're ending the infinity ending. <laughs> I thought about titling that infinity ending ending. <laughs> it seemed kind of weird. But in the last video, we basically left off with the idea that Adam Warlock was essentially met out of nowhere by a person that I kind of left you guys on a cliffhanger on. And the reality is it's not actually a person, but a group of people. It's pretty much all the versions of Adam Warlock from the past. And the funny thing about this is this goes all the way back to him, right? The guy who's not wearing anything but underwear. That's how Adam Warlock first appeared when he was in Marvel Comics. And this just different iterations of his character as time has gone on. And the funny thing about this is that Adam Warlock has historically been a guy where his understanding of, of the, the cosmos and the multiverse has kind of been really beyond most other people, even the cosmic entities themselves, right? It's the reason why Thanos wanted him to become the new living tribunal when we were reading one of the older Infinity stories. But when you, when you get into this, what you end up having is this scenario where these versions of Adam really kind of say, no, like self-preservation is more important than the universe. And there's a couple of reasons why they're coming from this perspective. The first is because they're sentient beings, right? It's just the nature of us as people. We care about ourselves more than we care about other things, right? It's just the way that we are. And so what we also have here is the notion that Adam Warlock can never truly die. And so no matter, no matter what happens in this universe, where it ends or where it returns, Adam Warlock will essentially always end up returning. And his other selves sort of recognize this, right? But the idea of Adam Warlock, and this really kind of seems to be an ideology for his character that's changed over the years, but the ideology of Adam, Adam Warlock at this point in time is saving the universe is the most important thing. And in reality, it's not as though they're killing off an entire universe of people. It's quite the opposite. Defeat one guy in order to save all of creation, right? It's classic utilitarianism. The needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. And so it's a, it's a cool perception here. It's a cool notion here because Adam Warlock has been without his soul gem for quite some time. Now, the reality is Adam Warlock doesn't really need the soul gem. I mean, it kind of helps to bolster his power a bit, but he never really needed it. I mean, he's exceedingly powerful even without the gem. But what he ends up doing with these various guys, these various versions of himself, is basically snatching the soul gem off of one of their heads and then essentially overpowering all the others. Now, we don't really know exactly what happens to them, but regardless of the situation, the result is that Adam Warlock ends up coming out on top. And so following this, he basically dives through a portal and into the consciousness of Thanos. Now, this is not the first time this has happened. They've been inside each other's minds before. In the subconscious mind of Adam Warlock, it's all about death and rebirth, right? People riding an elevator all the way up to the top of this cliff, more or less, falling off, dying, and then getting back up and doing it all over again. The cycle of death and rebirth constantly taking place. With Thanos, it was just nihilism reign supreme, right? Just, just death and destruction. And so Adam kind of dives into the mind of the one above all Thanos that we're talking about now. And the, the funny thing about this is that each one of these places that he sees is now an entire universe unto itself. Adam Warlock is hopping from one universe to the next within the mind of one above all Thanos. But that's more or less what's going on here. One of the first memories he sees, or one of the first things he sees, is Thanos as a little kid who basically breaks a, a lamp. Now, the funny thing about this is we can look at this a 
couple different ways, right? We can look at this story as being out of continuity, or we can look at this story being in continuity. And the reason why is because Suisan's currently there. For those of you guys who read The Rise and Fall of Thanos, I think it was, I think it was Ed Brubaker or, or Jason Aaron, one of those two who wrote it, uh, we basically got the life and times of Thanos, right? All the events that led to him in encountering Mistress Death for the very first time, and then going forward and becoming the villain that we that we all know and love. In the early days, Suisan, and when I say early days, I mean like almost immediately after giving birth, but Suisan tried to kill Thanos because she saw him as a bad omen and had a vision that his actions would lead to the downfall and the destructions of everybody on Titan, which it did. And so she tried to take him out and ultimately she was thrown in a mental institution. And so if this story is in continuity, at the time that Thanos is this age, Suisan should be in a mental institution, but she's not, she's there. So that kind of leads us to believe that either it was Jim Starlin kind of trying to correct things and saying, no, 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 this is how it should be, or it's not in continuity. But the other funny thing that kind of comes out of this is Eros and Pip the Troll. Now remember, these are two guys, and, and while they're not necessarily bungling buffoons, they certainly don't have any real kind of concrete plan, right? Their plan here to try to stop future Thanos from acquiring all this insane power, capturing his modern day self, and then going on to become the one above all. Their whole attempt to basically stop that is to convince Thanos that he's a good guy, that he's cool, you know, and that like Eros loves him. And that's basically it, right? Like words don't win conflicts more or less. And so because of that, we end up kind of jumping through these different moments and Thanos's life. And you kind of have Thanos when he's relatively young, when he's, you know, kind of going through that, that age of, of bodies changing and puberty, and he's kind of put on a few pounds, <laughs> you know, and drinking a soda, it looks like. And Eros tries to convince Thanos that, like, he's a cool guy, you know, that Thanos is great, that Eros loves him. And it is really Eros, like, trying to convince Thanos of this, right? The next time they appear is when Thanos is feeding some bullies to some monsters in a cave because the bullies needed to understand their place in the bigger picture. Following that, like, it's Thanos basically launching an attack and destroying the entire planet, uh, planet of Titan. All all these different things that are going on with Thanos committing these acts. And as this is going on, we have two versions of Thanos here. That's one thing to keep in mind. We've got essentially what amounts to present day Thanos or the easiest way to think about it. And then we've got future Thanos. And if you guys recall in the last video, we talked about this, right? Future Thanos was the one that was trying to attain the power to become the one above all. Present day Thanos is the one who is being used in order to follow in those footsteps and assure that that path was actually followed. And once present day Thanos went through all those steps, then he was absorbed by future Thanos to ensure that nothing would ever go wrong. And that's why you see this version of Thanos just sort of hovering in a tank. This is present day Thanos being held prisoner by his future self. And so Eros and them basically arriving to what's actually Thanos' first appearance in Marvel Comics when he fought Iron Man in terms of his uh, chronological appearances. We have them showing up in instances like during the events of Infinity Gauntlet. These really cool little moments here and there. And it's one of these things where present day Thanos kind of says, okay, like I can reach out basically psychically and I can communicate with them, right? I can talk to them through my past self basically. And that's what you see playing out here, right? Like Eros and his guys will show up to a particular point in time and then Thanos will talk to them. And as they basically kind of run over their plan, but they only get brief moments, right? They only get these really, really small moments. And the reason why this is kind of being held off, the reason why these moments are only ever so short is because present day Thanos realizes that if they stop and they talk for too long, it'll create abnormalities in the time stream that his future version will become aware of and then start tracing them down and ultimately realizing what it is that Eros and Pip the Troll are trying to do. Now, at the end of the day, again, it doesn't really matter. They're not actually doing anything, uh, but it is kind of a cool little effort, right? It's, it's a cool attempt. One of the other funny things to come out of this is that because of all these paradoxes and, and all these shifts that Eros and Pip the Troll are making, they end up showing up at a future point in time and we have the cosmic entities, but they're different. This right here actually doesn't really make any sense. And the reason why is if you understand the nature of cosmic entities, they exist in two forms, right? They exist in their true form, which is an abstract form. It has no true physical form, right? They're just an ideology. If you had like the desire to go get something to eat, it would be like if that desire to eat could get up and walk around, right? That thought, that concept could get up and move. That's what a cosmic entity is. Now, when cosmic entities appear in a physical form, they go to the dimension of manifestations and they basically uh, receive a form from Anthropomorpho and then they show up in the main Marvel universe in a physical form. But it's just one of these 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 small little things, right? So, you know, it's it's a it's a cool little moment. It's a little, a little wonky and a little crazy. But again, that's kind of what we're dealing with here are sort of these escapades of jumping back and forth through time. And so when Eros is talking to present day Thanos when they say like, like, I guess we can work together. And Eros is very much unsure about this because it's trusting a guy who's well known for betrayal. Thanos is kind of like, at the end of the day, our goals are basically mutual here. At the end of the day, like we're trying to achieve the same goal. I'm currently trapped in the essence more or less of my future self. Come there, rescue me. And then like, we'll save the day. And the cool thing about that is that when that happens, when Eros shows up, it's not really Eros saving Thanos. Instead, Eros is seemingly kind of whisked away. Eros just sort of says like, this isn't right. This isn't how it's supposed to be. And he just ends up taking off. Adam Warlock peeps his head in to see what Eros is doing while he's on his journey. And then 
basically, you know, once once that happens, Adam Warlock kind of pops back in or at least sort of disappears for a second when future Thanos shows up. And the reason why this matters is because future Thanos, as we know, was looking for Eros, not to kill him or to capture him, but because with Eros existing outside of life and death, then it was basically impossible for one above all Thanos to track him down. Now, again, this is Jim Starlin shifting things around. This is Jim Starlin changing things. Under normal circumstances and everything up to this point, it's not how the one above all worked. Everything that is, is the one above all. The face that you see when it speaks to things is no different than eternity popping up and then like talking to somebody, right? It's just the entirety of the omniverse and all things coalescing in the form of a face that can have a conversation with you. With that being the case, anything, even if it's outside the realm of life and death, is still part of the one above all. If it exists, if it talks, if it's if it's anything that can be drawn or written, it exists as part of the one above all. So again, Jim Starlin is kind of shifting things up and saying that's not necessarily the case here, right? Like, you know, anything that exists outside of life and death, meaning it can't truly die, it's outside the one above all's purview because it's considered an anomaly, right? Which is kind of crazy to sort of limit the power of the one above all. And a lot of you guys are making comments about that. You were saying like, well, I guess now he's just the one above most is what it is. <laughs> and you're not wrong, right? You're not entirely wrong. The one above pretty much most things unless the plot calls for him to not be above things like that's basically what it is you know and so it's 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 kind of wild here but with eros having popped up and basically shown up in the essence of future thanos to rescue present day thanos by default he made himself part of future thanos therefore everything is now complete right future thanos has attained his goal of tracking down eros and basically making eros a part of himself even if it was only because eros just sort of walked into it right so it's essentially thanos was trying to get eros into a house and eros just sort of wandered in there on his own that's really kind of what this is right now when future thanos basically leaves adam warlock then pops up and that's when present day thanos is like you have to free me from this prison but the the response of adam warlock is no i'm not going to do that you have to trust me here you need to stay here this is all part of my plan now thanos initially sort of questions it and isn't really sure but the reality is that adam warlock is kind of a master planner it's one of these things where when adam warlock comes up with a plan it's not really to be questioned the issue with this is we're talking about uncharted territory it's one thing to create a plan to have thanos lose the infinity gauntlet because he gets carried away with himself and because warlock understands thanos's subconscious mind and how he thinks it's another to form a plan against a seemingly nigh omnipotent being that cannot truly be destroyed by anybody here or really anything in existence right so you know like i have a plan to defeat a being that cannot be defeated that's kind of what that what that sort of comes down to and it's a, it's a little wild there because what adam warlock ends up doing is basically watching all of this go down right the idea was okay let's let this play out and let's see what happens it's a dangerous gambit because this could fail in in the most spectacular sense but future Thanos ends up doing what he intended to do he ends up wiping away all of reality now we didn't know what the motivation was before but we currently do now and the idea is that future Thanos looks around and and it's almost kind of agreeable in terms of what it is that he's doing and why he's doing it right at the end of the day he kind of makes this argument between utilitarianism and deontological ethics the intentions versus actions let's say for example that like you see a homeless man and you give that homeless man five bucks right your idea is to just give that guy five bucks to help him along his way but what if in reality reality by giving him that five dollars all you've done is make him a target for somebody else because he didn't earn that five dollars he doesn't know how to keep it and because he doesn't know how to keep it either he's swindled by somebody who dupes him out of it or he's not physically capable of holding it on his own somebody beats him up and then takes it would he have died had you not given him that five dollars that's the the philosophical quandary that we're talking about here and depending on what philosophical viewpoint you come from whether you're at fault or not begins to shift if we say the only thing that matters is intention right that's the only thing that really matters here is intention then at the end of the day it's like then your intention was to make that guy's life better and that's where your responsibility stops right that's where it ends as far as you're concerned you did what you thought was a good thing done right we're, we're we're finished there from there then it starts going into things like okay if all that matters is action then you gave that guy five dollars but then you also cost him his life and so is your act moral right you know that's that's the kind of issue that you run into here and so it's one of these things where thanos really kind of looks at it and says the only thing that really matters in this universe matters in this world is actions right what people's intentions are don't matter what matters are deeds and that everything is just a giant contest right even the cosmic entities seek to be supreme over the other in some form or fashion despite the fact that they're designed to be immutable despite the fact that they're designed to be these forces that that represent ideas and they don't really seek to better one another at the end of the day there's still a kind of contest there and so thanos's response is then we'll recreate things loyalty was conceived to deceive people trust is a fantasy for fools and is basically played upon by scoundrels who look to exploit 
supported. The universe as it exists now is one of naivety. It's people who believe they can change the universe and so on by just doing good things or believing good things. But at the end of the day, like it's a screwed up and terrible place. This seems to be like the core perspective of Thanos. And so with that being the case, he says, okay, then let's recreate everything. And so with that going down the, you know, with that happening the way that it does, you know, he basically goes to, to essentially recreate all of existence and it offers this momentary gambit, right? When you have Adam Warlock, who's essentially outside the existing multiverse, watching it all go down, right? Once he retreats outside of Thanos and kind of goes back to this outside the multiverse kind of space, then in turn, like once future Thanos wipes everything out of existence and then seems to recreate everything, we kind of get this brief moment where present day Thanos basically says, okay, now's a chance to actually do something. I get this brief moment to basically take this action. And then basically Adam Warlock just kind of wakes up in the void without any real indication of where he is or where he's at. He's just kind of out in this total oblivion of absolute nothingness. And the indication is that he's totally outside of all recreated existence. The Omniverse as it exists, he's way out there. To give you perspective, this is more or less just stories that have not been told yet. And so with him being out there, out in the void, out in the nothingness, there's no stars, no planets, no nothing, just infinite blackness. But he ends up getting this kind of lifeline that comes through a sort of portal where he's basically yanked forward by Kang the Conqueror. And that was the idea, was to, to, to really have Kang basically grab Eros and Pip the Troll to ensure they stayed alive. Adam Warlock didn't quite know what would happen to him, but the more important thing was to ensure that everything was safe. And the plan basically went as he expected, that in this moment of vulnerability, in this moment where future Thanos had basically dispersed his energy or attempted to disperse his energy, present day Thanos basically sees that power for himself. That after seizing all that power of the one above all from his future counterpart, because of the fact that present day Thanos never really agreed with his future counterpart, his future version ceased to exist just by virtue of destroying his essence more or less. And then present day Thanos used the power of the one above all to reset everything back to normal. And this is where the story totally falls short. And the reason why is because we don't see any of that happen. It's all explained to Adam Warlock by Kane the Conqueror who watched it all go down, right? So Adam Warlock wasn't even really a part of it. He wasn't a part of seeing everything recreated and all that kind of stuff. Some will probably say, well, we didn't need to see that. Others will say something, 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 Jim Starlin, higher plane of reasoning, who knows? But whatever the case is, it's basically one of these things where like we missed out on what could have been a really, really cool appearance of a story or some exposition and some explanation there in terms of like why Thanos did what he did in terms of like from his perspective, because we know why he did what he did and we get the exposition. It's just from some time traveling guy that makes stories overly complicated. And so it's like, okay, that's kind of weird. And so they kind of make a final stop in Adam Warlock, of course, again, still in possession of the soul stone presents the, the reality stone to Thanos and the truth. And this is kind of the important thing here. The truth is that it's entirely possible that his future self could get carried away with power again. And the entire process could repeat itself. But it's one of these things where Adam Warlock trusts Thanos, right? He trusts the character of Thanos to do what needs to be done. Not only that, it basically, we kind of have this, this sort of assumption that we have to make that if present day Thanos did take the power of the one above all from his future counterpart and then set everything back, that he may have just kind of walked the time stream to find out exactly what went wrong or where he kind of lived through the time stream. So he knows the mistakes that he made. And we kind of have to assume that like, if he did set everything back, he's aware of, of himself, right? He's aware of like what he would, what he would become or something like that. It's not clearly explained. It's not clearly defined. And I think that's kind of one of the issues here. Uh, it sort of leaves things pretty ambiguous, right? And it really feels like the ending of the story was wrapped up super fast, right? It was just wrapped up very, very quickly. And it sort of left a bit to be desired. But at the end of the day, things just kind of go back to the way they were before, right? Everything just sort of goes back to normal. And then you kind of have Adam Warlock, who's just sort of sitting there in a bar, you know, out in, or really in Starlin's bar is what they call it. Jim Starlin named a bar after himself, but he's just kind of sitting in a bar and just sort of chilling there. And people kind of have this concern that things are not necessarily going back for the better. But at the end of the day, we won't truly know. As far as I'm aware, this is the last of the Infinity stories that Jim Starlin's writing. Of course, I think Infinity Finale was also supposed to be the last one and then it wasn't. But at the end of the day, this is really where it just kind of wraps up. So with that being said, guys, we're going to bring this video to an end. If you are new here to comments explained. Make sure you guys hit the sub button to become part of the Rob Corps. If you guys enjoy this video, make sure you drop a like and I will catch you all later. Peace.